Everyone, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, this is Managing Design Standards and Material Libraries Best Practices. My name is Ingrid Velasquez. I'm the head of content and marketing for Folio. And as you can see, today is a very special day. We've assembled a panel of industry experts who very, very generously agreed to share their time and also their expertise, which they've honed over years of experience for managing materials efficiently and making the work of specification a little less chaotic. So we will introduce our panelists in a little bit, but first, co-hosting with me today and moderating the panel is Esteban Roikberg, one of Folio's board advisors. Esteban earned his bachelor's from Cornell University and his master's from Columbia University. He has received awards from the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute, the U.S. Swiss Embassy, the American Institute of Architects, or AIA, and most recently, his project won an award from the Society of American Registered Architects, or SARA. Hello, Esteban. Hi, Ingrid. Thanks Hi. for the introduction, and nice, nice to be here. It's very good to have you here. And also with us is Monica Ortiz, who is the ff and &E manager for Yoshi G, a commercial and residential interior design firm in New York. Hello, Monica. Hi, how are you? Good, good. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we also have Gerald Locke, who's a project architect and BIM manager at Catalitis. Am I butchering that name? Catalitis Architects. He's an award-winning architect Richard. from Sydney, Melbourne, and London. Hi. And last but not the least, we have Scott Barrington. He literally grew up around construction sites and eventually went into the business himself. He also created Modeler, a materials platform uh, that services close to 400,000 architects around the world. Hello, Scott. Good to have you here. Yeah. Nice to see everyone. Oh. Awesome. So as promised, Today, we are talking about the different ways that you can manage your product libraries to make specification more efficient and to prevent errors that you know can result in do-overs and wasted time and money. And we are also going to take questions after all of our panelists have spoken. So please feel free to type in your questions in the little question box on your <laughs> screens. And let's start with Monica, who is, again, the FF&E manager for the Yoshi G interior design firm. And Monica, so your whole job is to oversee the specification process and make sure everything goes smoothly. So can you tell us a little bit about your day-to-day -day and how you're, uh, and what you're doing to make it easier on yourself? On myself? <laughs> I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm actually trying to make it easier for my designers because for myself, it's, um, you know, I have a, <laughs> full plate um so i started um yossi it's really um he really likes uh to pay a lot of attention to detail and he hates errors so that's how i started uh, he hired me first just to check uh spelling and i start playing with folio and i just became a big fan and uh when we start having our weekly meetings, I start telling them all this stuff that you could do with Folio, and that's how I ended up here. Um, so our goals are to minimize uh, errors in our specifications. When I first started, uh, they were very uh, simple and all over the place. Um, and also, you know, how to become more, more productive and uh, increase our productivity uh, so I'm gonna talk about probably three things let me share my screen with you and all the solutions came because of the problems we were having at the office uh, so the first problem was that uh, the designers were specifying items that were either too expensive or not appropriate for certain projects. Uh, and the other thing is that, for example, we have projects that are uh, our standard projects or Jewish projects, which have requirements that are very different. Can everybody see my screen? 
Yep. Okay, so one of the first things, one of the things, this is probably one of the last things I've done. Oh, also, when I check my designers were cheating, so I created this column that I, I can only um, touch, and it means that the specification has been checked, and, uh, you know, I only have to, after that, if, if it has that, I only have to check that the location is correct or if they add some notes to it or anything like that. Um, so how I solved that was creating a project type column in which I, um, you know, decide uh, which item can be used in what type of uh, projects, you know, have standard Jewish condos, uh, high-end residencies uh, we also have healthcare and commercial projects synagogues ada start case for the sabbath mode because sabbath mode you would probably you need it for if you'll see here uh for fridges um, ranges etc and we do have some clients that want products that are cheaper than what we normally use so i created my categories and it helps a lot because um you know this way they, they stop using products that you know that were supposed to be just for residential use and they used it in one of the cheapest projects and then you know you kind of have to redo folio all over again so that's one um here too in lighting, we use that a lot. Uh, Monica, did you say that uh, you set the permissions to that column so that only you can edit that column? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So when you're you're using the permissions in Folio to determine who has access to what. Is that is that a are there other columns like that where? No, that's the only one is I needed to first, like if you see the asterisk, I, that was like my mark to say that I checked the project, the, the item, um, and they were cheating on me. <laughs> so I was like, well, that when, when we were allowed to, when, when Folio upgraded certain things, I was able to do these. And I took advantage of it. And it's amazing how much time I've saved by doing that. Because now this combined with um, replace from my library, instead of checking a product, I just, oh, it doesn't have my, my checking, then I'm just going to replace it. I don't need to check it. I mean, because it's going to maintain uh, the columns where additional information would be stored, like in the mm -hmm. notes column, for example. So when you said they were cheating on me, you were you were referring to the data being put into this in either wrong formats or in the wrong place. They were putting the asterisk on items that I hadn't checked, but because I do it everything so systematically, I could tell. I'm asking this question because what Monica I think is is addressing is actually a struggle for designers at all level. That is the the location of information, the standardization of information, and the distribution of that information with permissions, as you talked about earlier, even in an office with just one person, this whole conundrum of the top down and the bottom up, people contributing in different ways and somebody managing from above, it's, a, it's, it's, the, uh, it's the struggle that we're trying to overcome. So I just, that's why I'm asking this question, Monica. Okay. It's a good example. It's a good example of it. Uh, and, and that also, you know, I had the, another problem was that I was spending too much time checking items that we already had, and they were kind of like too lazy to look for them and rechecking over and over again. And, and, and another thing is that they're items that we use in every project. So with that, uh, this is another one that it's, you know, it has taken me a lot of time because it's pretty much trial and error. I've come up with all the solutions that we use here. So, um, for example, hardware. We use the same items over and over again. So I, what I decide in, in, you know, for standard projects like uh, multifamily, it's really easy to just um, uh, add things. Hold on. 
what happened. While you do that, I'm just gonna chime okay. in and say, when you, when you just just now discussed, oh, it's pulling up right now. Yeah, hold on. Okay, sorry. Yes. So what I created is like every style of hardware that we used. I just, um, you'll see here. I put all the items that you would need to use. What is going on? Well, <laughs> it's not working. While, while you do that, I'm just going to ask you. Oh, here. For example, uh, let me show you. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, so we have each collection in different coatings, like black. Uh, this is clover satin chrome, satin brass. We have the M-Tech Helios, you know, the, you know, the ones we've used. And so if you go there, um, you'll see that we have the door viewer, the knocker, the chain, the entry door. I mean, all the, every, every single kind of hardware you would need in a project, we put it there because I found that it's easier to delete items then actually be adding one by one to the project. Here, you just click here and copy all in the, in the project, whichever you style and finish you would like to use. And, and this is, you know, this is my collection of those. Let me just ask you, you know, one of the roles of technology in a folio is, is to re, uh, avoid or automate the repetition of tasks. Um, mm -hmm. specifically tasks that are often mundane and get repeated. Technology's yeah. role is for that automation, but you're saying people are still picking items that are already in the library because one of the hurdles of automation is in fact that people know what, what's there and what's not, that is the sharing of the knowledge. So how do you prevent people from picking and choosing now items that are already built into the library and doing, making duplicates essentially? Um, I actually, well, I, you know, I told them, like, you have to go to, go to, I, re, I, I suggest that they go and go to this library and look, you know how here you can see where, where it's located. Oh my. Um, so they can go and usually I have what it's called my C folders, which are my own libraries that I created. Uh, and I tell them to go there and copy them from there. Did they create their own libraries as well or add to the library? Do the users in the office contribute individually or do you manage that? No, how I do it is like every project that goes, um, that we, you know, work on, uh, I have the folio. I don't know if I have a page here with, but okay, we have a project and I go checking every item and as I check, I make sure that everything is perfect I put my yes and I copy it in the library. Where, you know, I see. Okay. I, I've already Thank organized you. the way I want it. And so it, it, right now, I like this year, I can really see a big improvement on, on how our productivity now. It's, it's amazing. Once you have everything in place, it's like it goes much quicker. So what is the biggest savings, if you don't mind my asking, in terms of time or energy or that you have seen using it? The sa what do you mean by savings? Like Savings on time and, and energy, like employee <laughs> energy and time. Well, what happens is, uh, okay, this is how it works. The designer does the design, and then they start filling up folio. Uh, sometimes it's another person, because I've done it many times. Um, then it comes to me, I check it, and then we coordinate with Revit because all our tags have to work and, and sometimes, uh, oh, we're missing this item or that item or this is not going to work. We need to get a new one, for example. So I come, come with the liaison between both and, um, it, it, you know, it has helped me a lot. Like now it's super fast because... Um, now, a lot of my projects, before I had like two or three of these items and I had to check the rest. Now, spe especially with, with the designers that really care about their performance, I mean, most of the project is like, I, can, I have to barely check it at all. 
you know, it's only like the custom items or, or new items. Like, you know, furniture is usually something that is going to be different every project. But plumbing, hardware, appliances, they tend to be, you know, a select number of items that we use. So that's a useful segue also at the end there, Monica, uh, when you started addressing Revit and BIM integration, um, because I think we're going to have panelists also talk about some of the uses of, of, of BIM and Revit. Um, Ingrid, <clears throat> how are we on time? Uh, we're good. We're good. Do you? Okay. So I had... So we, we still have time for one more or... Yeah, let's do it. Um, okay. This is the library and sometimes I end up with three of these. Uh, so what the replacement has helped me a lot because what I do now is that in this case, I don't have one that I'm going to keep, but let's say I, I want to keep only this one. Uh, to consolidate, I would go to this project and just replace the item and then this other one. And I go there and then the three become one and in, in for, for, for designers to look for things like that, it has become so much easier. Because I don't know if you remember that in the old days, like every item that you would use in, in a new project, it will duplicate itself. So now as long as they don't touch my uh, item specific columns, I'm fine and, and I only got one of each. I just wanted to ask, Monica, when you gather the data, do you use, I see the Folio Web Clipper installed in your browser at the top right corner. Yeah. Yeah. So are you using the, the Folio Web Clipper to gather the contents for each of these and then modifying the data? Or, I mean. I gather it from theirs. If I don't like the way they have it in the website, I, you know, right. change a few things, but. Yeah, it's it's a time saver. It's a you know one one click you can add so much information. Uh, for example, I always um, they love that I put the documents. For example, because you know a lot of the the builders uh, have their tablets at at the construction site and they can check things there. Uh, another thing that I'm loving now is the parent and kids you know components feature because uh you know there's a lot of products that are like mix and match and uh, designers always forget to add one or two parts so what i'm doing now is like you know we i'm gonna have for these welcome toilets i'm gonna have one for each plate for example because then they don't have to worry i mean i have all my parts i just click on it copy it and they don't have to worry about it anymore and I don't have to waste time checking it again and again. And, you know, so. It's, I must say, I'm impressed with the quality control. That's <laughs> yeah. So I think that's it for me. Great. Right. Good. Very good. Thank you very much, Monica. Uh, so, yeah, on the topic of um, managing BIM, I believe that's uh, what Gerald is mostly going to be talking about today. Um, and also about, um, you know, they do things a little bit differently in Australia mm -hmm. when, when we talk about managing architectural specifications and schedules and, uh, you know, doing it in spreadsheets. So, um, Gerald, uh, what are the typical issues you come across um, in this process and how do you get around it? Right, yeah, so um, as I mentioned in my, um, yeah, my synopsis, from what I've seen, most practices are still, um, dare I say it, back in the Stone Age, as far as how um, they're operating um, with their with their schedules, and it it's what we've noticed at FK is that that's it's a very risky position to be in, but no one's really offered anything up until um, platforms like Folio have come out. Um, 
and we've, we've only just recently discovered that ourselves. So what it's meant for us is, um, and as um, Monica's touched on already, <clears throat> it's a lot of work for our quality assurance uh, manager and his uh, minions to to literally go through every single schedule and every single project to check every last item and make sure, and not just spelling errors, but really critical stuff like oh, yeah. um, uh, com how, you, how you've added components, because if it's all in Microsoft Word, um, yeah, it, it, it's an incredibly- it's Much harder. It's so labor intensive, it's ridiculous. And it's, it's kept a, a small army of people going uh, just to make sure that it's all Correct. No, and I, I, I did start with, with the checking of spelling and then it became, it become this thing that like, you know, how deep you can go into specifications, right? Like, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, the model number. And look, we've, we tried, so currently we're using, um, uh, Microsoft Word and we have, we have a, a large template and we have a, a subtractive process. So we, we have a pre-written set of um, what you might call, yeah, a pre-approved um, items, mm -hmm. whether it's concrete finishes or toilets or tapware or, um, you know, louver systems, anything like that. Um, yeah, Gerald, is that um, is that document based on a, a template like master spec or something, or is that something you guys have written in house from we've scratch? Written it out, so we've written it ourselves from scratch. Yeah, okay. and it's it's constantly under development, um, and is is often having uh, new input not just from our designers, from our interiors team, but also from our sustainability committee. Um, we've recently had uh, a few initiatives going through to to make sure that wherever possible um, we're avoiding using red list products so anything that yeah. uh, has a clear label gets pushed up the list and we're um, my um, one of my selling points to the um, to our quality assurance team, uh, as well as to the sustainability team, was that hey guys, we each of these items could just be a single line in a database, and we could have exactly what Monica's got, um, with a review status, um, research dates, assigning who's done that research, and and uh, really having a lot more accountability, um, which just literally does not exist in a Microsoft Word document um, or even a spreadsheet. Can I ask you, Gerald, is there a designated individual or individuals to manage the template or do people contribute? How is contributions and, and evolution of that template done? Uh, yeah, so um, we, we have a quality assurance manager who's responsible for all of that content. Um, he's able to delegate uh, uh, a lot of the heavy lifting <clears throat> just in terms of uh, formatting and, and moving stuff around, but, but largely he's responsible for the, the wording and, and the review of that content. But, and that's a full-time job for him. And is that, is wow. that content ever have to make it into the drawings via BIM software, whether it's Revit, Auto, whatever you're off? No, using? So, so the, currently the only connection is the tag code. So in our, document we have uh, you know all of our items listed and beside each one for each project we just add the the tag <clears throat> the tag code so um that's the connection okay <clears throat> so we're using archicad as our bim software um which allows us to um through a couple of different methods, uh, assign those tags, um, and it, with a with a high level of consistency. So, so we've we've got that managed from the BIM side, and really all we've found is that one data point connection is sufficient, um, and that in fact 
it's probably a good idea to keep most of the schedule data out of the model and just to have that code connection is sufficient. Um, mainly avoid, because, yeah. yeah, just to avoid model data bloat really, um, because a lot of it, uh, it doesn't make it through beyond so our documentation um, completion. We don't hand that data over as part of the model. Although coming up with, with the new um, ISO 19650 uh, standard, which is uh, an, a new BIM standard that's coming out, which will require a lot higher um, data content as standard. And I think as, as our clients become more savvy in that regard, um, especially our institutional and commercial clients, that there's going to, we're going to need to have a lot more accountability with that data. We can't just, you know, cross our fingers and say, oh, you know, just, just look at the code. Um, they're going to have a model with all this information packed in there like a, a suitcase. So, yeah, it's, um, it's really, uh, Folio has come along at a, a perfect time for us in a way. Um, and, yeah, it's, I, I think it's going to be a real boon for our, uh, for our QA team. Uh, as well as for the designers who uh, so often when you say, hey, guys, so have you, have you got your schedule sorted out for this project yet? We're, you know, we're going to tender in a month's time. And they're like, Ugh. you know, just the, the thought of having to edit a 30-page Word document with a whole bunch of stuff that they know has all been, probably 70% of it's been done already in other projects. And it's really just a matter of copying and pasting hoping that the product is still available, that it's still uh, appropriate for the project. Um, yeah, it's, I, I, I think this way forward is going to be uh, just uh, so many times better. Well, I'm, well, I am curious to know, we haven't really explored the your Revit plugin. Uh, we, we only have a small Revit team in our office. Um, but I'd be curious to know uh, as as we as we uh, trial the project for, uh, trial the platform further um, how that data connection happens and and maybe Scott or Monica can speak to that I'm not sure. Yep, absolutely. Uh, yeah, we would be more than happy to show you. Um, I see that you've been having conversations with our designers as well just to make yep. sure that everything's, um, you know, working according to your particular workflow. So, yeah. yeah. And yeah. Um, I think that, that was a good, yeah, I think that was an excellent actually segue from Gerald to Scott and continue some of the conversations because the issues you just brought up about what is the data point of contact between this information over here and this inf building information modeling data over here? How do they interact? What are the shortcomings and the opportunities? <clears throat> and I think maybe if we can address, I guess the similarities across the countries, because we're in different countries, more than the differences. Uh, Scott, if you want to take it away and talk about your experience tackling some of these issues. Yeah, yeah, it's probably a good segue. I lost Scott for a second. So, there. so just up front, oh, New Zealand. Must be. America easy. and I'm based normally in San Francisco. Oh, everyone hear me? Yes, you're back now. Yeah. Cool. Sorry, that's. <laughs> Awesome timing. Oh, no, don't worry. Um, as I was saying, I'm normally based in San Francisco Bay Area, but right now I'm in New Zealand, where I'm a, uh, where I grew up. Um, I kind of got to see the differences across continents. Um, and one thing interesting over here is Australia, New Zealand. Uh, it's quite high other products like Archicad and Vectorworks, whereas often in the United States or North America, when people talk BIM, they're literally referring to Autodesk Revit. Uh, but BIM is really an umbrella term, and then there's different types of BIM software. Um, I actually grew up and learned ARCHICAD as well originally. Um, 
So, so one of the problems when we started Modeler eight plus years ago was exactly that, was uh, how it started, was just trying to get the manufacturer's products into the right format, uh, or formats, obviously. So Archicad, Revit, Vectorworks and things. Uh, and the problem would always come up as exactly this, is how much data can you actually include in a, a Revit family or an Archicad object? Uh, and then also too, how do you even keep it up to date? Because uh, a lot of people forget, and I think that's where platforms like Folio are gonna take over, is BIM software is not online, it's offline. It's desktop software, it has to be updated. So if someone downloads a Revit family of, I don't know, a light fitting, it's like downloading an app. Unless you keep it up to date, it just basically goes stale. Uh, and that becomes a real issue for managing mm -hmm. data. Uh, also, kind of seven, eight years ago when we started, uh, computers were, just weren't as good. So you just couldn't include all that information in your ArchiCAD or Revit file uh, because the model would just get bogged down and in a lot of cases freeze. Um, and then also, even now, you just have a lot of interoperability issues. Um, I even know within some firms, I won't name names, but I know of numerous big firms in North America where their design team uses SketchUp, SketchUp their development team uses Revit, and then their documentation team uses AutoCAD. So there's no, um, whereas at Gerald's office, I'm sure it's probably ArchiCAD all the way through, but there's a lot of big companies out there or practices who don't do that. Different teams are using different software. So right. how do you take the information from Revit to AutoCAD efficiently? Um, and, and that's a real issue that keeps coming up, which once again, why actually storing as much data as you can in some kind of online system uh, like a folio actually makes sense because long-term, if you do something in SketchUp, you push it up to the cloud, you can pull it down into your different systems. Um, also, something I've seen over the years as people have tried to put more and more into the BIM software is the honest truth is the database that's built into these products is not as good and probably will never be as good as the type of relational database you can access online. So when it's online, you can access like AWS SQL or Oracle or you know, these are big database products that are very powerful, which is the sort of thing Folio is built on top of. Uh, if you're downloading the rate, latest version of Revit or Autodesk, uh, Revit or Archicad, or the, the database module in there is never going to be as good because it has to run on your computer. It, it, it's just the database is never going to be as powerful. So that limits long term what you can do. So I'm fairly bullish on this trend of a lot of this information will move to online systems and then the BIM software will act as more of a client that plugs into that. Um, so I, I think that's an interesting trend and I think you're going to see more of it. Um, also, there's just so many smart things you can do once that information is in the cloud and kept up to date. Like even just keeping product information up to date is actually a nightmare right now. Um, one thing we did at Modler was if we knew someone had previously downloaded a Revit family of a light fitting, we'd alert them if a new version of that came out. Uh, however, we're still relying on them to download the latest version. Uh, just like if you pick up your iPhone, you've probably got some apps that are out of date. So there's a lot of issues there. Um, and then another one we've always found is just getting the manufacturers on board. Uh, it's really great now because globally there's a lot of standards coming out where it's confusing as every country and continent has a different standard. Uh, and I'm sure you guys have all experienced this because big practices like yours, Gerald, you're probably using materials and products from all around the world. Uh, your door hardware might be from Germany. Your flooring might be from, uh, I don't know, Thailand. Um, and, Things have different standards and what happens is, and we see that this manufacturers all the time, is they, they support, the, if they even support a standard, they'll support the one in their local country. It becomes very difficult for them to support six different standards. Um, when, when we originally started, there wasn't a standard. So we kind of just had to follow whatever the trend was. Uh, and people do the best they can. And I mean, that still happens today, if I'm honest. Uh, but as the standards are coming in, it is helping a lot. 
uh, I think back to my previous point, it will be interesting if the standards start forcing a lot more of this data to be put into the models and into the actual BIM file. I'm not sure if that's the right answer because I just worry about this, basically the metadata going stale, the SKU code changes, the the available finishes change. Whereas all, if all that information is kept online, it's more like an Amazon.com where you can go there, you can see how many of those are available. You can see the latest info. If I open an Archicad file that's, I don't know, six months old, because let's face it, building projects take a long time. Uh, there's a high chance you'll find if they've downloaded a BIM model from a manufacturer, there's a high chance some of them are gonna be out of date. Uh, and by the time the project, uh, especially things like finishes, you know, if you go through and specify all of your door hardware directly in the BIM model and there's no live connection, by the time the contractors on site are going to get that door hardware, it could have been two years or maybe longer. Uh, so this, and there's always been this issues with specifications going out of date or products change, but I think people just have to be really careful with that information. And I think keeping that information in a database that's easier to keep up to date. You have someone like Monica who can keep it up to date. It's accessible to everyone. Uh, it, it's gonna, it is the future of how it will be. Um, and if the manufacturers are eventually on board and help keep that data up to date as well. Uh, I think the dream for BIM has always been that everyone's working on this amazing model together uh, at the same time, all the different stakeholders, all the manufacturers, and there's this one source of truth that um, some people term it like a digital twin. The building's finished, that model gets passed on to the facilities management team. Uh, we all kind of smirk when we hear that because I'm not sure if any of us could name a project where that's happened seamlessly. Yeah. Uh, I think once again, that's where the online systems will solve that, not necessarily this desktop based software, which predominantly has been today. Yeah. Um, that, that's kind of been my experience of it. Uh, I'm not sure if that's similar to you guys. We're, we're seeing, uh, the opportunity here to get that rich data set but keeping a more tenuous connection because currently the way that we uh, federate our BIM model um, where we have a, 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 a combined services model usually, which has the um, hydraulics, the plumbing, the mechanical HVAC um, uh, structure, as well as the architecture model. Um, we federate the individual authored models into um, a specialized uh, product which doesn't allow you to edit the model but it allows anyone with a, a free viewer to interrogate the model and yeah. so we thought if we can standardize the reference codes that each of those models have then our database that has all the required information the specifications for each of those all they need is one data point can just be the drawing tag or some yeah. other master ID Code. that then says, okay, when you're looking at this element in the model, it has this tag. You can look for that code in your, uh, in your online database and know that it's correct and it hasn't gone out of date. So the model, like you're saying, Scott, the model could be two years old. Yeah. But that um, specification database um, is fully up to date. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. But, and then there's, um, I, I mean, an interesting question I've, I often ask is that BIM model, the kind of master model, who, who owns that? Does your firm own it? Does the client own it? Does it... That, it that comes down to the BIM execution plan, um, but generally it's us. Generally it's the, the architecture firm un until handover in which at which time it goes to uh, either the client or the facilities manager yeah and if you have an institutional clients as you mentioned before gerald 
and also Monica, I saw synagogues listed there and other, other uh, large property or asset holders. You are in a, essence developing a standards template or library for the client to reproduce yeah. in other properties across their properties. So handing over this, as you said, the handover the BIM model is also in a way, you know, solidifying those standards for them should they choose them to be standards across multiple properties or projects. Yeah. And, and there, there's a there's a conversation, a fairly detailed technical conversation that needs to be had up front uh, when we're forming our BIM execution plan to say, okay, guys, so this is what we're going to be making for you. Just in the same way that we're going to be making this physical um, building, we're also going to be giving you this very specific set of data that you can navigate in virtual space and you need to tell us what you want in there. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so we're, we're quite rigorous um, on those BIM projects to, to make sure that we are, that we're not going, going off um, on our own uh, fantasy, creating what we think is the best thing. We need to ask them, well, you know, what do you guys need at the end of this? Yeah. Interesting. Um, I kind of had one more talking point, which is always a bit of an interesting conversation that sort of dovetails into that is just um, around, and this has kind of been me doing this for the last few years with manufacturers is uh, how do we educate the product suppliers and manufacturers on this? Um, like I know Folio has a great system where you can send it to suppliers and get them to fill it out. And I actually really like that because it keeps the information standardized. Um, because one thing I've found through the different manufacturers with what that model has worked with is just trying to help them understand that, especially getting the information into BIM and specification and documentation. Um, a lot of them kind of think of BIM as these fancy 3D models. And they, so as an example, like appliances, like an oven, they expect like this detailed photorealistic Pixar movie level model uh, and we, we've often had numerous clients actually wanted to use the model for television advertising, like to fully render it photorealistic. And we've often had to have a tough conversation of like, look, that model is just an empty box. There's no shelving in it. There's no lights. There's no wiring. Uh, because often in Burma, and correct me if I'm wrong, Gerald, but you don't actually want this really high res detail no. thing you just bogging box. down your system. You just want a box. Yeah. And then, like you say, with the correct tag, and then you can store as much information as you want in an online database because data storage there is essentially unlimited nowadays. Uh, but every little bit of data you put into the BIM model on a big project just start bogging it down. Um, especially especially if you're, geometric data. Yeah. Um, and I mean, computers are a lot better now, but you think about five years ago, um, even five years ago, like a modern system was one, this were expensive, but two, they would get bogged down pretty quickly. Uh, so in the past, I've had to have a lot of conversations and more educating the manufacturers on where they fit into the process and actually the best way, <laughs> the best way to get that information to people may not actually be putting it all into these models that they then send as a static file. It may be actually having it in a really accessible database that different systems can tap into. Maybe that's a folio. Maybe it's Excel, maybe, you know, whatever. Well, you no, there's no maybe. Your own database. It's a folio. <laughs> well, yeah, of, co of course it's, I mean, but some people are crazy and don't use folio. But no, I mean, I those <laughs> crazy talking people, about yeah. <laughs> we, that's a good one <laughs> um, so I mean for those silly people who don't use folio it still needs to be accessible and I think eventually there's going to have to be almost standards on how that information is put out into the world like right now you say you collect it in word and the architect like your firm's actually built a lot of IP around those word documents that get used again and again I mean it's actually a serious amount of R and D has gone into that, even if often it's not thought of that way. Um, but I think eventually there's going to have to be some kind of data standard on not just how these BIM models are made from a 3d parametric point of view, but actually how is the rest of the data distributed and get up to date 
Um, and you see that with other web standards, like in web standards, they have RSS for like blog syndication and they have different data standards. Even in real estate, they have, in America, they have the MLS systems and there's kind of a standardized method for sharing house data. Uh, I think there's gonna have to be a lot of work around what does that look like for building data, not just for what's going into the BIM software, like is it IFC for BIM? That's what people have been pushing, but, or in, in North America now, weirdly, often the standard is Revit, just because it's Revit is so highly adopted over here for better or worse. I don't have a horse in that fight. Um, but I think there's going to have to be some kind of online data standard around this. Um, and where it's good is when that happens, it's actually a lot more accessible because it can just be an open standard like an XML. Uh, whereas a lot of systems now with BIM are quite closed, like a Revit file is, you have to open it in Revit software. You can't, can't convert it to XML. Um, I know from my days when I was building ArchiCAD objects, you could convert it. Uh, but uh, yeah, so, so I guess what I'm saying in a roundabout way is it's going to be an interesting time and hopefully some of these kind of online standards come out too, because I think that will make it easier for manufacturers. Um, but, but it's going to be interesting. But I, but I think, like you say, Jared, if you can put the minimum amount of data in your BIM file and then tag it to the appropriate system where you can have unlimited data, I, I think that's going to be the way you're going to manage it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then for it, example, what we do sometimes, for example, you give two options of, of an item. We do that a lot, and you only have to have one tag in your Revit, but then you can have two, three different items. Well, you know, finalized with the client, you you don't have to have just one item there. And Yeah, and there's also the interesting thing I've seen some firms do, and maybe, Gerald, you can speak to this too, is, um, sorry, I'm not trying to pick on you, but... Um, the like often people will actually just use the generic BIM library, but then just tag the products appropriately. So they don't even require a 3D model of that file to put in their BIM yeah. model. They just use the generic ArchiCAD light, but then you tag it with the appropriate link to the proper product in Folio. And that often makes things a lot quicker to change. Like say the quantity surveyors come back, the project's over budget because let's face it, it's normally over budget. Um, and they want to switch out the lighting from expensive German lighting to a cheaper brand. You can do that really quickly in a folio with a couple of clicks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then if you've just used the generic placeholder in, say, ArchiCAD that's the right size and tagged appropriately, it makes that variation a lot quicker rather than having to go through a 3D model and replace out this proprietary built ArchiCAD object of the ABC light fitting. Uh, I, I don't know if that's how you guys manage it currently or... Yeah, it is. Uh, and we, we have our own in-house... <clears throat> excuse me. We have our own in-house uh, object creators, um, like with Revit family creators. So, um, And we've, we've built our own um, library that has, you know, generic toilets, basins, all those sort of things that... Uh, completely non-proprietary they look nice in plan they look nice in that they, they they render on the different uh, ways that we view the model yeah uh, in a predictable way so that we we know what we're going to get from our drawings and then yeah literally all we need to do then is just tag it correctly and then it can speak to our um our schedule yeah and it it, right. it keeps our, our models nice and light um, you know, otherwise you get people going off to, you know, bimobject.com and downloading a, a toilet that's got 25,000 polygons. And yeah, just, and you're designing the Eureka the tower. tower and the whole thing. It just, you can't They're even the open the thing. Yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah, we're, we're definitely on top of that. And it's really, for us, the critical thing is getting the integrity of that um, schedule uh, and, and authoring it efficiently. Yeah. Uh, so not to interrupt, but I do have to interrupt a little bit because we only have um, <laughs> a bit of time. We have a few minutes to 
um, for answering questions. So guys, if you have questions, please post them now. Um, and while we wait for that, um, so Gerald mentioned um, designer accountability, and this is actually super interesting. And Monica actually has a follow-up to that. Monica, did you want to show us um, yeah. how you do that? Yeah, actually, I was having the problem that some projects we have two or three designers um, collaborating, and then I didn't know who to ask questions. I, I am always asking them questions. Why are you doing this? Why are you using this thing? And so I came up now, you know, as, as um, Folio was giving us more things to do, I started like, well, how can I deal with that? And, and so I created these other columns, like, you know, I use these templates here. And so I have one that it's product status, if it's approved, if it's pending corrections. Uh, this is for the designer, if they modified something, if it has my, my marking, but if they modified it, they can let me know here. So I will check again that everything's correct. Uh, if it has discontinued, usually I use it when, when the item is discontinued, but I don't know how old the project is. I just leave it there and add a new one to it, like a replacement one. Uh, this is a, our boss, so I have, if he approved it, if the client approved it, if they eliminated it, for example, um, the reviewer, although right now I'm the only one doing it, but <laughs> those were, uh, then I have a list of who created um, the specification. So we know who, who to blame. And, and mostly it's about who do I ask questions to if, if I see problems with an item, right? And, and so this is the creator and here I assign who I'm going to ask the question to and then I put it under comment and that's where I make, you know. So once I'm done checking, I tell the designer, you can go look and find your comments and they look at the comments and we deal with them. Either they fix things or, or we discuss it afterwards or whatever, but you know, and we do keep track of what's going on. So. All right. Very, very nice. Um, so uh, we do have a question that just came in from Sean. And um, Scott mentioned this um, about getting manufacturers and, and suppliers on board. So Sean is asking, and anybody can answer this, um, what recommendations do you have to get buy-in from these other um, stakeholders, let's say? Uh, would you like me to answer? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so. I've spent, yeah, yeah. It's, it's always hard on Zoom. You don't know who's looking where. Um, I've always, I've spent probably the last eight years of my life talking to manufacturers about getting them on board to, uh, and, and it is tough because they, when you see how much they spend on offline old school channels versus supporting digital things like BIM, but even just having a great website, uh, it, it's quite scary what they still spend on, say, a one page magazine advert versus actually giving the architects what they want, which is, which is tough. And I've spent a lot of years and lost a lot of hair trying to convince them. Um, what I've kind of learned is a few things uh, is one is really lowering the barrier to make it easy for them. So like if you're having, if you're having to support and build an entire BIM library of their products that are all parametric in Archicad, Revit, SketchUp, Vectorworks formats, that's a big undertaking. Uh, a lot of them have the money. It's not the money who internally manages it, who's going to do it, like who actually even understands it. Um, so, so what I liked about Folio is it really does lower the bar to getting the information you need because you can send, Monica can send them a request and they just fill out a form, uh, or in a lot of ways you can use the clipper and just take it from their website. Hopefully their website's structured and up to date. Uh, but let's assume it is. Or it has no so, errors. So really, yeah, or it has no errors. And then, you know, cause there's still a liability there. Like if you copy the info, is it your fault? Is it theirs? 
Um, so, so any way we can lower the bar to get the information we need into structured formats, I think it's going to help everyone. And I think kind of this concept I harped on a bit earlier around if we can get the structured data into an online database and not have to worry about pulling it all the way down into the BIM software itself, I think the information we need in a form. If we have to go to every manufacturer and try and talk them into supporting these systems. Sorry, my, can you guys still hear me? Yep, you're back now. Yeah, cool. So, so yeah, so I'm not sure where it cut out, but um, I think any way we can lower the bar to get the information we need in a structured format, I think is going to help everyone. Uh, and that's where like things like an online product really help a lot. Uh, and like I've seen uh, the request you can send with Folio, it's pretty simple. And if a supplier can't fill that out, then they're probably not a great supplier. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it, it, is, it is just anything we can do to lower the bar, uh, I, I think helps a lot. And there's still a lot of education. I mean, yeah. the more architects who are asking for it, the, the faster it's going to happen. Uh, that's right. what we'd always find. So we do have two more questions um, from Vadim Stenkin. Uh, and this is for anyone. Do you use Folio or any other software connected with it to manage cash flows during the procurement uh, process? We don't, as um, we, we're still trialing it, so yeah. Okay. This is an interesting question about like the boundary, the scope boundary of a platform or of a software, because in the U.S. I can speak to the accounting and the timesheets getting integrated, which is a logical first step. But then you get into, of course, the invoicing and where does it end? And if you start getting into specifications and estimating. So I think that the tendency to try to manage it is to keep a proxy, which is kind of actually exactly what Scott, what everyone here has been talking about, the proxy in between the BIM model, the cloud. Right now, using Folio as the example, how complex is that proxy? And building complexity up to a point and then also dumbing down what's coming into the proxy. So I'm just going to interject with saying the city of New York, and I know this from a classmate in undergrad who worked for the city to try to digitize the plan submission review process, which was a huge hurdle in filling in online forms and implementing data for buildings. And they said, oh, forget it. Let's just upload PDF. And that dropped the bar. Believe it or not, that, was, that in and of itself, just that simple realization to do it that way, allowed them to immediately go online within six months. And that was the solution. So sometimes that lo-fi meets hi-fi, which I, I sense is kind of the answer to Vadim's question about a, mixing accounting and estimating into it. Interesting. All right. So since we've gone over time, uh, we do have one last question. Uh, and it's for Gerald. Is there a timeline from your client when the ISO 19650 BIM workflow standard must be implemented? And what are the things that your firm does to prove that it has been implemented? Uh, it's, a, it's a very new um, standard and no, we, we don't have a timeline for implementation at this point. It's really just been flagged up with our standards committee as something that um, we need to get on board with uh, ASAP. So yeah, I guess to answer the question, no, no specific timeline, but um, it's not something that can be ignored. We, we really just need to interrogate uh, what the requirements are and how do we best uh, facilitate that transition? Right, right. All right, so I think that is all for us today. Um, again, thank you very much to everybody who attended today. Um, I hope you learned as much as we did. And thank you very much to our panelists uh, for taking time out of their very busy days to, uh, you know, to give a little information today and uh, you know educate us a bit and uh, especially Gerald um, it's 8 a.m. it was 8 a.m. where you are when we started um, Monica I know you're super duper busy every day and Scott uh, you know you're you have some personal things going on right now and 
Um, yeah, thank you very much. And Esteban, it's nice to have you here, um, you know, moderating. You again, <laughs> <laughs> All right. So thank you again, everyone. Have a wonderful day and we hope to see you again next time. Okay. So, thank you. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.